Good morning, everyone. We are so glad you are here with us uh, at OU. Um, if you are in the room, we're going to go ahead and stand up, shake hands with the folks around you, make everybody, uh, make sure folks feel welcome here this morning. If you're watching online, we're grateful you're there with us as well. Uh, as always, you'll have the words on your screen so you can sing along at home so y'all can get settled in with your coffee, whatever you need, and we'll get started.
Good morning. You guys be seated. My name is Chris. I am one of the pastors here, and I'm so glad that you've joined us for worship today. If you're with us online, we're so glad that you're there as well. Leave us a comment and let us know that you're here. Uh, as we continue worshiping, I want to lift up a few announcements for you. Some of them are in your bulletin. One is a book study that's coming up. It's a six-week book study. It'll be on Sunday mornings, and it will be immediately following this service. So if you come at 10, you can, uh, if you come at 10 and worship with us, you can stay at 11. There'll be child care. It'll be right across the way. Leslie Walkington will be leading. Leslie, wave at everybody. She, Leslie Walkington, she just went, woo-hoo. Yeah, she just said, everybody come to the study. It is about your problem. And your problem is you're too busy. You're too busy. And you need help slowing down. And this is a study about how not to hurry as much and slow down and make space for God. And Leslie's going to teach you how to do that. Right, Leslie? Right, of course. Uh, if you, uh, maybe that's not the thing that you want to do to get involved. Maybe your thing is service. We have a service opportunity. Uh, I'm going to invite Jeff up. Everybody say, hey, Jeff. Jeff works at Camp Lake Stevens, and that's what I'm talking about. People are excited about Camp Lake Stevens. That is amazing. Camp Lake Stevens is a, is a, <laughs> a retreat center for kids and youth on the edge of our town, and we're doing a service Saturday opportunity next weekend, and Jeff is leading the project. Jeff, what are we doing at camp? Um, we are refurbishing our adventure camp. If you don't know anything about our adventure camp, it's these really cool tree houses that are like big giant screened in porches down by our lake um, and we just got to redo some they've been there for about 10 or 12 years so we got to do some rehab on them so we'll do some like demolition work if you want to have a sledgehammer in your hand 
Um, we got a little bit of that. If you want to flex your carpenter skills, show us all your beautiful inlay work and everything like that. We're going to be putting everything back together. Um, we're going to be doing some screen work. So just lots of like lots of different uh, variety of activities for people to take part in, uh, different skill levels too. So yeah, everybody say thanks, Jeff. All right, bye, Jeff. <laughs> And that'll be from 9 to noon on uh, Saturday, next Saturday. If you want to participate, the information is in the bulletin. And also, uh, every Sunday, we have a big team that helps us out with worship. There are a lot of opportunities for you to serve on Sunday morning. That information is in the bulletin as well. If you would like to do that, check a box to give us your name and take this to the connection desk, and we'll make sure that you're connected to the team. I want to invite the ushers to come forward at this time as we continue to worship this morning. Um, I want to pray for us as we uh, move in the direction of hearing God's word today. Let's pray. Most gracious God, meet us in this place by your word and spirit. Help us to do what we can't do for ourselves. Help us to slow down. Help us to make space and room to hear you so that we would be not only moved to change, but that we would be uh, given everything that we need to move deeper in our life with you. Um, help us to give our lives to you so that you can give our life to the world so that others might have life. Amen. Let's keep worshiping. Been walking for a while My feet are getting tired Heart's a little heavy, but you keep me going. Been walking for a while, mile after mile. My soul's a little weary, but you keep me going. You keep me going. Said it be a narrow road. You said it be a narrow road. So why am I surprised with it? Seems I'm on my own. You said it be a narrow road. This world will never be my home. The journey might be lonely, but I'd never.
Got to get the allergies out. (coughs) A reading from Psalm 25. Hear the word of the Lord. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed of who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord, to teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for your goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who are they that fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They will abide in prosperity, and their children shall possess the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart. And bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all of my sins. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. O guard my life and deliver me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all of its troubles. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Dariah. I want to point out, she had prom last night. <laughs> she didn't know she was going to be reading. And it was a really long read. So, thank you. So, good morning. So, we have a little different, a little different sermon this morning. It is a sermon by interview. Come on. <laughs> Y'all hear me good? So, just doing something slightly different. I'm here, conversation with Charles Allen. Y'all, a lot of y'all know Charles. I'll let him introduce himself in a second. Uh, you may have seen him last last week at Easter, where he stood up front and his little precious son was baptized on his wife's birthday. It was a big, big Easter. It yeah, was it was a big, a big day. day. Easter, so. baptism, and birthday, all in one. We had a great day. Yeah. So, coming off uh, coming off Lent series. Uh, as y'all know, is the way of Jesus according to Mark. Uh, the burning question for me has been, from this point on, how do, we, how do we create space in our lives for the Spirit to work? Chris already said one of our biggest struggles is busyness. How do we create space in, in our lives for the Spirit to work in our lives? Uh, in other words, help me, help you, help me to live my life the way Jesus would if he was living my life which is a good definition of what spiritual formation is. So the psalmist, the psalmist gets at this, is the psalmist that Dryer read. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. So the question we want to wrestle with as we listen to Charles's testimony is, how do we make space to wrestle with God, honestly. Um, so a few observations before we hear from Charles, just to lay a foundation. Scriptural truth. Jesus calls us to repent, believe, and follow. This is discipleship. Discipleship is, 
It's not optional. Dallas Willard, spiritual writer, Christian writer, calls it apprenticeship. Uh, learning to live the way of Jesus. Second, there's a life reality that where there is consistency in life, there you'll find formation. Period. No matter what it is. So we're all formed by something, and consistency over time is the name of the game. And third, it's already been referenced, people are busy. Amen? Amen. Uh, most of us live in a frenetic pace. Now, here's the deal. As somebody who recently moved to Oxford, it's not just Oxford. We're not that unique. It's everywhere. It's part of in our, our American, it's in the air. We're just busy. And we, need to, we have to wrestle with how do we make space. So that's the struggle. That's the challenge. The good news is God is merciful compassionate, full of steadfast love, and I firmly believe, or I wouldn't be sitting here, that we can change by the grace of God. Amen? So, Amen. I want to hear, Charles, thank you for being willing to share your story, and um, you are a man who lives in Oxford? Yes. Okay. Tell us a little bit more about you, for those who don't know you. Yeah, uh, so my name is Charles Allen. Um, I grew up in Greenwood, Mississippi, went to school at Ole Miss, and uh, my wife and I have lived here about six years now. Uh, married to Annalise. She's from Gulfport. We have three wonderful children, uh, six-year-old Clara, four-year-old Stella, and five-month-old Julian. Easy. And, uh, very easy, yes. With a wife like Annalise, it is easy. Okay. <laughs> uh, She's not in here so, right now. You don't have to. Uh, <laughs> she might be watching. <laughs> uh, no, so that's, uh, you know, I'm a tax and estate planning attorney uh, here in Oxford, and uh, just like everybody else, I just uh, struggle with uh, being too busy, always in a hurry, too many things to do. So as we talked, you talked about where you were. So give us a little background on you, on what brought you to this point? Where, where were you? What was the struggle for you? Sure. I'd, I'd say in short, I was living what I would describe as the American way of life. You know, on the outside, things probably looked pretty good. Uh, you know, most people who, who knew me or, or saw me would say, you know, that, that I had everything together, everybody other than maybe my wife. Uh, you know, but on the inside, there was this constant churning, just, just this unsettled nature. Uh, I was chasing the wrong things, the wrong identity. I spent a lot of time thinking about the future. You know, things are going to be good or things are going to be great when X happens or when I reach that next rung on the ladder of upward mobility up and to the right. Not really living in the presence as I should. Uh, a, a good metaphor for it, I think, is chasing the carrot on the stick. I was constantly chasing the carrot on the stick of the next thing, only to realize every time I got there that the goalpost had moved. Um, so more often than not, I had this low level of anxiety um, that was really hard to shake. And the carrot on the stick really took on a lot of different forms. I mean, it, it could have been money and financial things, material things, social status, career achievements, uh, all of them just ultimately unfulfilling. Well, you, you, you've talked about a light bulb moment, and I think in Scripture, I think of Paul on the road, I think of Peter, I think of Jacob. Uh, people had this just encounter with God that was a point where they could say that was an aha. Things have, even if it's small, things changed. Tell us about your light bulb moment. Yeah, so you mentioned Paul on the road to Damascus. Mine was on the road to Dallas. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it, it all started with a podcast. Annalise sent me. Similar, I was, similar towns. Yeah, so very similar. So, uh, so she had sent me a podcast. I was driving to Dallas to pick up a truck. I was going to turn around and drive right back the next day, so I had a lot of time on my hands. The podcast was titled The Four American Gospels, and it was by John Mark Comer. In the podcast, he talked about the four most prevalent gospels that are preached in America today and so many great things about each of them. But he also talked about where they're lacking. And the primary thing where they're lacking is, is, is a true call to discipleship. Uh, you know, Jesus calls us to be disciples. Uh, so that podcast was the second in an eight-part series on what is the gospel. So I went back and started at number one and listened to all eight of them. The first one was, what is the gospel? In that, there was a quote by David Foster Wallace, who was an author and social critic. Uh, and to my knowledge, was not a, a publicly professing Christian. Um, in that quote really hit home for me. It was an interview talking about one of his books. It was called Infinite Jest. The book, he said, was about what it's like to live in America around the millennium. And so 
the interviewer said, well, what is it like? And here's what he had to say in response to that. There's something particularly sad about it, something that doesn't have very much to do with physical circumstances or the economy or any of the stuff that gets talked about in the news. It's more like a stomach-level sadness. I see it in myself and my friends in different ways. It manifests itself as a kind of lostness. It's a real American type of sadness. I was white, upper middle class, obscenely well-educated, had way more career success than I could have legitimately hoped for, and was sort of adrift. A lot of my friends were the same way. Some of them were deeply into drugs. Others were unbelievable workaholics. Some were going to singles bars every night. You could see it played out in 20 different ways, but it's the same thing. I get the feeling a lot of us privileged Americans have to find a way to put away childish things and confront stuff about spirituality and values. Um, yeah, so for me, this was an accurate description of how I felt, what the American life was like when you're chasing the wrong gospel, the wrong metrics of success. You know, as you mentioned, we're all formed by something. We're all following some type of gospel. The question is, which one? Is it the gospel of materialism, the gospel of upward mobility, the gospel of social status, of careerism, or the gospel of Jesus? Um, you know, so David Foster Wallace also had... Uh, you know, something that really hit home when he said this in his speech, This is Water, which is a famous speech he gave at Kenyon College. It's a, a great speech. And again, this is from someone who is not a publicly professing Christian. Uh, in that speech, he concludes, there's no such thing as atheism. We all worship something. The only thing we get to choose is what do we worship? And he says, the compelling reason for choosing God or a spiritual type of worship is that everything else out there will literally eat you alive. Worship money, power, beauty, sex, they all end the same way. Uh, but these are the defaults in our society. These are what are encouraged as it's all about me and self as the center of our world. And they're all, they're all good things, but when they become the center and the focus. Yeah, when they become your idol, they'll just eat you alive. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so our culture encourages that. It encourages you know, the self as the center of our universe, um, you know, so much so that it just becomes an unconscious action. And we all, when we sit down and think about it, we all know this to be true. And so the key is finding a way to keep this truth up front in our daily consciousness. Um, and listening to Chris's sermon on Easter Sunday, talking about hope, it really reminded me of uh, Bob Dylan's last thoughts on Woody Guthrie. This is a poem he wrote about Woody Guthrie, and it, I think when he reads it, it lasts about seven minutes. It's, it's a long one. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, but in it, he goes through a bunch of issues that cause us to stumble and come to the realization of what we need. And here's what he says there. He says, you need something to give you hope. But hope's just a word that maybe you've said, maybe you've heard around a windy quarter, down a wide-angle curve. But that's what you need, man, and you need it bad. And the trouble is you know it too well, and it gives you the chills because you can't find it on a dollar bill or Macy's windowsill. He goes on and on about all the places you can't find it. You're not going to find it at a yacht club or a nightclub or a supper club or a fraternity house. Um, then he concludes saying there are two places you can find it. I would argue one, but this is what Bob Dylan says. The Brooklyn State Hospital or church. He says you find Bro uh, Woody Guthrie in the Brooklyn State Hospital and you find God in the church of your choice. And you find them both in the Grand Canyon at sundown. Uh, as someone who loves the outdoors and nature and frequently experiences God in nature, uh, I would agree with that last statement. Uh, you do find God in Grand Canyon at sundown. And I was there a couple of weeks ago to witness that. So it's really cool. Um, Just throw that out there for us to be jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get to that point in a minute. Uh, so uh, anyway, you know, the point is there's no, there's to, to reiterate what Chris said, there's no lasting hope in good beer, good music, springtime optimism, Christmas time optimism, all great things, but you're not going to find lasting hope in them. You're only going to find real hope in Jesus. Everything else is really just bankrupt soil from a spiritual perspective. Um, the only way to really live a deeply meaningful life is, is, is following Christ, apprenticing under him. So through this whole journey, uh, I was introduced to a concept of spiritual formation. This is terminology. I grew up in the church, a fantastic church upbringing my whole life, um, uh, save maybe a little time I got away during college, and I'd never heard that concept. Or if I'd heard it, I wasn't listening. Yeah. So uh, this concept of becoming like Jesus and apprenticing under him, discipleship. Robert Mulholland, in his book, Invitation to a Journey, describes spiritual formation as this. This is how he defines it. The process of being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. That's good. Uh, yeah, process of being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. 
he would describe my epiphany as the awakening, the first step in a spiritual formation. In the awakening, there's an awareness of a door being opened to this whole new dynamic of being that you have never knew was out there. We come to a threshold of sorts, and we know we have to respond, either by stepping through that door uh, into that new dynamic of being, knowing things will never be the same, or we may fall back asleep, to use his terminology. Uh, this happens at different times for everybody. It could be uh, radical for some, could be gradual for some. could approach that threshold many different times before you finally step through, so there's no, no one-size-fits-all in this. So. Yeah, it seems like every life stage has its own threshold uh, to step through. So the question is now, like, tell us where you are now. What has changed? Uh, and not only that, we know everything's not great, hunky-dory, perfect, because life is life. So, um, you know, where are you now? Where are you still wrestling? How are you, st- how are you following Jesus? Sure. Uh, I'd say now I'm much more settled. Um, you know, I, I don't have sort of that low-level anxiety that affects me. I've experienced meaningf- meaningful change in my life. I have a very long way to go. I fail daily. You can just ask my wife or my kids. Um, but I try to stay grounded in the present, seeing things through the lens of gratitude and seeking to become a, a non-anxious presence in the room, whereas in the past maybe I was an anxious presence in the room. Um, you know, trying to live out Jesus' uh, love, joy, and peace. I think a way to sum it up is living in the world but not of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do we do that? You know, to achieve this, I think we really need separation from the world. And I'm not talking about separation in the form of, you know, going and living in a monastery and becoming a monk. Um, I'm talking about, you know, I, I think what it looks like today is more of a mental or moral separation from the way those around us look at things, from the way other people value things. Um, we need to live in the world and not of it. We're called to be disciples, uh, and so I don't, I don't think the, the right answer is to go live in a monastery. I mean, it is for some people, but, but not for me. Um, so I, I think separating ourselves from that is, is a great way to do that. So a lot of this journey has really been guided by some books I've read, including The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, Habits of the Household by Justin Whitwell Early. Chris did a sermon on that uh, last summer. Um, just a, a few gems from there that, that really hit home for me. When you talk about hurry, it's not just a disordered schedule, but it's a disordered heart. Mm. Um, our schedule reflects our priorities. And when we're at peace, when our schedule is aligned with our values, um, you know, I'm sure all of us could pull out our iPhone and look at our schedule and just, you know, 100 different things on there, just so much going on. Um, you got to be careful, though, because where you give your time is who you become. And so I, I, as part of this awakening, if you will, it, it's not only an encounter with God, but also an encounter with self. Um, you know, a- asking myself some really hard questions that I don't like the answers to, frankly. Um, Oswald Chambers uh, has, a, has a quote or a challenge, really, that really hits home there. Here's what he has to say. Ask yourself, am I getting nobler, better, more helpful, more humble as I get older? Am I exhibiting the life that men take knowledge of as having been with Jesus? Or am I getting more self-assertive, more deliberately determined to have my own way? It's a great thing to tell yourself the truth. Um, it is a great thing to tell yourself the truth. It's also a hard thing. Yep. Um, So I'm turning 40 in less than two months, and there's a couple of quotes that stick out to me about turning 40. So the first is, at 40, you have the face you deserve. Uh, (laughs) That is, you're set in your ways. It's hard to change. I'm sure there's some truth in that. Um, You know, we we all know it's hard to change. But the second, which I like a little better, is life starts at 40. Everything else before that is just research. You know, so I, I like this one better. It's never too late to start on this journey you know, for some, it might happen when they're 17 years old. For me, I was 38 years old. For others, might be 85 years old. Uh, you know, but it's all, all in God's timing. Uh, as far as, you know, putting all of this, you know, into practice, some quotes that really hit home from John Mark Comer, the first one. Ideas are just the beginning. Unless they move from the mind to the body, they will never be a reality. Uh, from Justin Whitwell Early, until our hopes make their way from our head to our habits, nothing changes. Uh, Say that one again. <laughs> until our hopes make their way from our head to our habits, nothing changes. Yeah. You know, C- C.S. Lewis in Screw Tape Letters describes this as, as the anticlimax, the difficulty and often point of failure where we move from dreaming aspirations to laborious doing. Um, you know, it's easy to have these great aspirations in our head, 
but then when we actually get down to putting in the work the laborious doing uh, it becomes difficult and that's what he describes as often the point of failure but while hard there are deeper riches you know going through all this and, and the payoff is worth it and this is where spiritual disciplines come in uh, practices that help us grow in grace help us experience God's presence that we make space for that and we make space for the disciplines and God uses that to make space in our hearts for more. Uh, what has helped you? What are one or two things that you've, that you've added to your regimen that have helped you create space for God's presence in your life? Sure. Um, I'd say the first thing that's helpful is this. Start where you're at. That was very helpful to me. Yes. Start where you're at, not where you think you should be, um, not where your friend is, not where your spouse is. Start, start where you're at. Yeah. One small change can have a big spiritual intake, just one small change. And, and you can refer to this as a keystone habit, a habit that begets other habits, that helps you build on that. Uh, if I had to pick one to start with, it would be Scripture before phone. When you wake up in the morning, start the day with Scripture and silent time, pray and reflect. Approach the day in God's you know, grat gratitude for God's goodness rather than looking at your phone. Here, No one in there has that problem, right? Before I started practicing this habit, here's how I started my day. I'll roll over. I look at my phone. The first thing I look at is work email. Um, so work email is certainly important, but if that's the first thing I'm looking at in my day, I'm now framing my day around this, uh, you know, productivity. What do I have to get done? A uh, my to-do list, and that's that's all I'm thinking about. And I just rush into the day, you know, in in a hurried, frenzied state of mind. Um, the other thing is, you know, social media. You know, social media, if you look, open up Facebook in the morning and start scrolling through Facebook, that's the first thing you do. Well, now you started your day with comparison or envy, and, you know, everyone on Facebook is just beautiful and perfect, and they're all on these awesome vacations, and you're just late for work again because you've looked at Facebook for 30 minutes. You know, so I've been there. So, uh, uh, you know, so... To, to assimilate this to a spiritual discipline, uh, I would say silence and solitude. Silence to me, and solitude. Yes, yeah, silence and solitude. To me, this is not just an external silence, but it's an internal silence as well. Just really sitting, to, sitting with God, listening to Him, praying, um, just you know, being present in the moment, what some would call contemplative prayer. Um, there's an old interview with Dan Rather that, that uh, Dan Rather was interviewing Mother Teresa. And he asked Mother Teresa, he says, when you pray, what do you say to God? And Mother Teresa says, I don't say anything. I just listen. So then he flips the question around and says, okay, well, when you pray, what does God say to you? And she says, he doesn't say anything. He just listens. Uh, yeah, I love Mother Teresa. <laughs> and, uh, so, and then she goes on to say, and if, if you can't understand that, I can't explain it to you. Uh, but I, I just thought that was a, a great sort of, you know, contemplative prayer, just, you know, making space to really listen, listen uh, to God. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard, really hard to sit in silence today in, in the hustle and bustle, particularly for me. External silence is, is easy, and as an introvert, I really need that, um, and I can find that. But the internal silence is what's, what's tough. My mind's constantly racing a million different things, and there are many days it's all over the place, and it's really hard to focus um, but that's okay. As I heard someone put it, you know, every time you start thinking about something else, that just gives you another opportunity to come back to God. Hmm. Um, so slowing down and focusing on what matters really is life-giving, living in the present, taking in the moment and all the goodness that there is out there. Um, another thing I want to mention really just seeing God's grace through all of this is, is, first of all, God's grace and patience with me, um, you know, as I've lived my life and being, you know, so long in hearing this. And then uh, the other is, you know, I, I know this current spiritual journey that I'm on has answered many, many prayers that my wife has prayed for me. Um, she has been so supportive through all this. We've often been on different paths and different places in our faith, but we really came together when I started this journey uh, in so many ways. Our, our faith, how we want to raise our kids, just life outlook in general. And, and that's been uh, a real blessing, and she's had a lot of grace with me as to, to get to this point where I am, even though I've still got a very, very long way to go. And it'll be a never-ending journey, too. Um, and then the other thing is God has continually placed the right resources in front of me, 
not only the right resources, but I think in the right order mm -hmm. to help me continue to take the next steps along the journey. Whether that's a sermon from you or Chris that just really hits home with where I am in my journey, or the initial podcast that started it all, or any number of books I've read that's been influential. Um, the saying is, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Mm -hmm. And that's never been more true than, than what my spiritual journey has been. So. That's awesome. Well, as we close out this morning, uh, I was reminded, listen to, this, listen to this several times as we were preparing uh, over the last couple of weeks, I was reminded it was an old radio jingle growing up in Jackson. I think it was, I can't remember, Z10, I can't, can't remember the name of the station any, anymore, but it said, it might not be your favorite song, but it has some of the same notes. You, you know, when you hear a testimony like this, it's never going to be exactly like your testimony, but you heard something you can relate to, because at the end of the day, so much of us, we can relate to what our, each other's stories, which is why it's important to share them. So thank you for sharing yours. Uh, just to close out, just a couple of encouragements. Uh, do what Charles uh, suggested. Take an honest inventory of your pace of life and lean into God's holy character, uh, his character of grace and compassion. Uh, the psalmist says this. It's got two remembers. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which, have, which you have shown from long ages past. <laughs> do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O God. God is in the business of new starts, and there's grace upon grace as you're going through with that journey. And, and lastly, I would say, uh, if, if you have a, a pattern of spiritual disciplines, keep going at it. Keep going at it. If you don't, don't try to do everything at once. Pick one thing and start small. Uh, I would say... Uh, Charles's recommendation for scripture before phone in the morning is fantastic. Uh, read your scripture in the morning, pray, even if it's a short amount of time, and dedicate at least a month to working on that practice. Don't, don't compare yourself to other people's spiritual journeys. Let God uh, talk to you where you are. And if you need a clear and helpful first step, uh, we do have that book study starting next Sunday. Uh, the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, um, which I've read, and it's great. In fact, it's good for, I'm going to say tweens and up. If you have a 456 child, youth, I think it's never too early to start getting the grasp on the f uh, frenetic pace of our culture. So and you had one thing you wanted to say about yeah, it. Yeah, so I just, you know, to, to pitch the book, I mean, the, the title, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, that, that's inviting in itself. Who doesn't want that? Um, this is a, a really great book. It's a great introduction to spiritual formation. Uh, the way it's written is very conversational, so it's a, it's a very easy, quick read. Um, I just want to give you a, a quote from the introduction. This is from John Ortberg. Here's what he has to say. To choose to live an unhurried life in our day is somewhat like taking a vow of poverty in earlier centuries. It is scary. It is an act of faith. But there are deeper riches on the other side. To be in the presence of a person where hurry has, like Elvis, left the building is to be inspired about the possibility of another kind of life. Amen. We'll, we'll end it on that. Let me pray. And then Charles will be up here afterwards. Come give him your thanks. So let's pray. God Almighty, you're doing things at, at OU. We thank you for the way you're impacting and working in the lives of, of our congregation and the people of it in it. We thank you for Charles. In his testimony, Lord, may the words that, he, that you said through him challenge us through that. We want holy conviction and give us the grace we need to make the changes we need to make. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to say one more thing about this book, the study. This journey, I am a neophyte and have a very long way to go, but I really want other people to join me on this journey. Amen. So. We have to move props to the other place. <laughs> All right, would you all stand and sing with us?
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Cause your name is power Your name is He your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over fear and all. Speak Jesus. Sing that again. Oh, yeah. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety. To every soul held captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Oh 
Thank y'all so much for being here. Uh, one of the things I was reminded of as listening, uh, listening to Charles talk is in Genesis, when Jacob wrestles with God, God changes his name to Israel, which means wrestles with God. And I think it's the, it's the picture of what it looks like to live life. And it is good to be able to wrestle with God in community. And it's good to hear people's testimony of wrestling so thank you, Charles, for, for sharing that with us. And now let's receive this benediction. Let's go this week. Uh, go this week in the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to speak the name of Jesus to ourselves and to the people who need to hear it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. And everybody says, amen. Y'all have an awesome week.